Okay, I guess maybe we can start. So, so last time we, we started looking at the awesome formula in the classical setting. And then we, we said several times that one of the goals at least of this part of the course is to introduce the Poisson first number boundary, which is a generalization of that uh, Poisson representation formula to an um, arbitrary group action. So, so let's briefly recall uh, what was the, the, the classical setting. So in the in the classical setting, we have the formula, the following formula for a disk. So in the disk, we, we had H infinity of the disk, which were bounded harmonic functions. Harmonic in the classical sense, so the Laplacian vanishes. And then we had this other space, which is L infinity of the boundary. With respect to the Lebesgue measure, which are clearly just bounded functions, let's say essentially bounded. And then the the classical um, the classical representation formula exactly says the following: that given given a function f on the boundary, the measurable, bounded, and measurable, we can define the harmonic extension inside. So we have u of r e to the i theta to be the integral one over two pi, the integral from minus pi to pi of f of e to the i t and then there is this Poisson kernel that we described and analyzed last time that so this is in d and so once we have that then then u is harmonic and bounded. And then uh, last time I did this calculation, and uh, now it's also on the yeah, next version of the notes that, that showed how indeed this uh, formula that seems complicated indeed can be thought of as a um, integral with respect to measures that come from the group action of SL2R on the boundary. So the group here is, once again, is G SL2R, which is, uh, let's say PSL2R, which is the isometric group of D. And of course, uh, this also, also acts by homeomorphisms on the boundary. And, and so in, in fact, what you, you can say is you can define the formula in an easier way, which was the following, that given, given a point inside, you pick G, G A, in this group of isometries, so that G A of A is the origin zero, and then we can uh, uh, represent the value U at A uh, just in the, in the following way, it's an integral over the boundary of what? Well, you take the function f, which is a function defined on the boundary, and we push it forward by this map. So for instance, we can 
yeah, we can write the integral like this. So is f of g a psi d lambda. So lambda is the Lebesgue measure of psi, or which is the same because just of the push forward formula, this would be also f of psi d g a star. So this is the push forward of the Lebesgue measure when you integrate it. So, so this is the, yeah, this is this uh, intriguing computation that we did last time. And now we can realize that this, this context that we have here is, is very general because basically we can do the same thing uh, for any group action that you have basically. And that gives rise to the notion of a Poisson transform. So, so let me give a definition of that. So in general, we have what's known as Poisson transform. Which is, we, we look at we, we start with a group with a measure on it. Measure group. And then we have a boundary. So candidate boundary. So what is the first thing that um, that a boundary needs to have is that, well, first of all, it has to have an action of group on it. So, and then it has to have a measure and the measure is stationary. So the definition is like this. So we call it a genius space is a, um, yeah, is a measure space B new where G acts on B by measurable isomorphisms, so, so measurable maps with measurable inverses, even though most often it will act by homeomorphisms, but I don't think it's needed on this level. And, and new is mu stationary. Meaning that mu star new it's new. But this is the first thing that is required. It's not the only thing. But once we have this, we can already uh, do the first step, which is to construct the map. Yeah, one map between harmonic functions and bounded functions in one direction. And so this is called the Poisson transform. So we say the Poisson transform. Is is the following is a is a map phi between L infinity of B nu and H infinity of G mu. Remember that the, this one on the right hand side is the space of bounded harmonic functions on G, and it's defined like this. So phi, so you pick a function f on the, yeah, which is bounded on the boundary. So it's an L infinity. And then we want to know how it acts on G. G is an element on the group. So this is in L infinity of the boundary. And this is in G. And we do exactly what we did before. So basically we take the function F, take the measure new, we push forward the measure new and we, take the integral, we pair it with F and we integrate over B. So this is an external general process. And what it turns out is that this process gives rise to a harmonic function. This is not completely trivial, but it's 
a fairly simple calculation. So the lemma is the following. Then that indeed phi of f is mu harmonic for any f and so we had to prove that okay so so let's look at the proof the proof is fairly straightforward it's just a calculation so what do we need to check well we need to check that if you take phi of f of g h and we integrate with respect to h yeah we'll have to question whether is this the same as phi of f of g And so now we, we literally just write the definition. So, so, so what is this? Well, this is the integral over G and phi F of GH, you have it written up there. So it's another integral, it's the integral over B of F GH psi d new psi and then we still integrate in d new h this is just a, a definition of phi and then fortunately there's really not, not too much to say because this is by definition of the convolution this is the integral over p of f of I don't know, let's call it eta. Let's say that eta is g h psi by, we do this sort of change of variable. And this is d mu, mu star nu of eta. This is definition of what convolution means. And then we know that mu star nu equals nu by the fact that this measure is stationary. So this is the integral of f of eta d mu eta of b, right? And this one is by definition is phi of f of, wait, sorry, <laughs> sorry, I, I, uh, there's a g, yeah, sorry. I don't need to do g h, just h, yeah, sorry. Sorry, the, the G should still be there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so we, we, we do the change of coordinate eta is H times psi, not G H. Anyways, this is just a, the computation, and once we once we have we have this, we know that this map is, is harmonic. So of course the the problem here, the question that we can ask at this point is that is is phi a bijection? So we know that phi goes from L infinity to H infinity. And of course, the easiest thing to do would be to say, okay, B is just a point then if you see if B is a point, every measure on a point is invariant. So, so G star nu equals nu. And so basically there is no dependence on G anymore. And so you get a constant. Right? So this is obviously the first remark is that if B is just a point, then yeah, the image of phi is just constants. And of course, this may not be the only thing if there are other harmonic functions. So if more harmonic functions, 
This is not. But basically, the, the definition of Boston boundary that we will see soon is made, built so that precisely you get the, that this uh, transformation phi, this transform is an isomorphism. Any question so far? Okay, so what else? Now let's, uh, yeah, now we need another step. So we don't need just the notion of G space. So here we introduce this notion, notion of G space, which is useful. But uh, in fact, we need a further notion of boundary to make this uh, to make this really a theory of, of boundaries for minor walks. So we need the second notion, which is a notion of new boundaries. So again, this is a, another definition. So new boundary is a bit stronger than just genius space. So given, again, given measure group G mu, then a measure space B nu is a mu boundary. If the following if is true, if there is yeah, there is a G equivalent map P from the space of infinite simple paths. I will I will recall you. To be new, such that P composed with T equals P, where T is the shift in the sample path space. So, so let, let's unravel this definition. So what is T first of all? So T is a shift. So again, omega, recall that omega was, was the space of what we call WN, simple paths. So infinite sample paths. So it, it, it is a copy of, of, of infinitely many, uh, it's a product of infinitely many copies of G, but uh, we interpret those are the locations of, of the walk. And then we uh, we have this, this measure P, which, which came from pushing forward the product measure on the space of increments. So P is a natural uh, measure on the space of sample paths. And then what is T? T is the shift. So T is, is a map from omega to omega and just maps WN to WN plus one, the shift. And the way to interpret this is, is simply that you are Relabeling the time along the sample path. You're not you're not really uh, changing the location, but just just the time. So basically, in the picture, for instance, if we started the identity group, then we have the w one, w two, w n, and so forth, w n plus one. And so once we shift, we're we're just 
you know, changing the time. Instead of starting from the identity, we start from W1 and so forth. So this is just a shift in, in the space uh, of the sample paths. It's not the shift in the space of increments. This is completely. So I recall that in fact, one interesting thing about the shift that we said at some point is that T is not measure preserving. No. Okay, and, and then what do we want? We want, basically, we, we want to find, so what's the, what's the idea of new boundary? The idea of new boundary encapsulates what we already have seen geometrically, that there is a point, psi, on some boundary that we don't know what it is, but, but we know that, you see, if the, this uh, P composed with T, equals p means that I assign to the sample path a boundary point. And if I shift the time of the sample path by one, the boundary point is the same. And that makes sense because this is just a limit. So let me see, let me show you what is the main example, which I think will clarify everything. So an example in the geometric situation, again, we have G, is a is a it's a group of isometries of or it's a subset of the group of isometries on some metric space. And then we know that X has boundary, some modification. So it could be a compactification, but also did not be compact, so that's why we call it modification. So you have X and you have some no boundary, so exactly the picture that I have drawn. <laughs> so we have some under X and X is the space inside. And then suppose that like we know for the disk, uh, that almost every sample path converges. to some point in the boundary. So then we can define, see, we can define P, the projection from the space of sample paths to this boundary as the limit, as then gets to infinity of the sample path, for instance. So exactly in the usual situation, And then you get this, this boundary point Xi. And this we can interpret as a function of the infinite path. And now what do we want to ask? So is this a, a, a new boundary? And the, is this a new boundary? And the answer is, is yes, because, so, okay. And then again, the new would be the hidden measure. So, Mu of A is the probability that the limit converges to some subset A, as we already did. And then we check that this is new is a new boundary. So then this with new is a new boundary. And what do we have to check? Well, we have to check Again, this condition that there is a map from the space of sample path to the boundary and it's shift invariant. And so let's check that it's shift invariant. Well, again, P composed with T of some sample path of WN is what? Is P of WN plus one, which is the limit 
and then goes to infinity of w n plus one. Oh, so you're looking at the same path. You're just changing the time on. And so this one, of course, is since you're taking the limit, this is clearly the same as the limit, and then so goes to infinity of w n o. And so this is p of yeah. So, so indeed we proved that P composed with T equals P. So this is a formal way, the notion of field boundary to, to say that for every sample path, almost every sample path, we can associate, yeah, this map is, is measurable. So, so it's almost surely defined. Yeah, this map is almost surely defined. Shouldn't we always also check that uh, new is a new stationary? Right, so it follows, I think, from if this map is G-equivariant, there are two options. Either, yeah. So I think if we do it this way, if the map is already G-equivariant, then then it follows from from the the fact from the properties of p that if you push it forward you get it in your station Vivian yeah uh would the one point compactification be a mu boundary it is okay and yeah. there's there isn't anything that says different random walks in some sense have to go to different places for a mu boundary we don't care about that right exactly mu boundary is this weak notion yeah, so okay. it's a candidate boundary. And so, in the, yeah, so we don't know this is the best possible boundary. But yeah, the one point compactification is absolutely always a new boundary. Indeed. So, indeed, maybe let's write it. Indeed, that P equals one point <laughs> with new, just the delta mass of that point is it's always a new boundary. So why did you say the mu stationary part is obvious? Is it because PT, so it follows from PT equals P or? Yeah, there are two options. So you can either, yeah, so, so, so here I also said G equivalent. Okay. So, yeah, so, so if we combine that P composed with T is P, and I com I use the G equivariance. Then I push forward. So then new becomes the push forward. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, if I define it like this, I guess the new has to be the push forward. Yeah. So I guess I should. I should say it like that. Yeah. Yeah. A priori new. A priori you could you could. Yeah, a priori you could uh, yeah you could start with without requiring anything about the measure, and you just you just define new to be the push forward. But maybe since we write it like that, we can say we can we can we can put it here and new is the push forward. Yeah. I I see I see I see I see okay yeah thank you. Yeah, yeah. So in fact, I think this calculation was one of the calculations. We will do a similar calculation uh, soon. So yeah, you will see. Yeah, yeah. Or otherwise, yeah, you don't. Yeah. So but, uh, yeah. Okay. Any more questions? But yeah, this is a obvious. Yeah, this is a good observation that we would we would add. Note that indeed any new boundary is a Jimmy space, namely, yeah. If if new is uh, yeah, P star P, 
we have new star new. In fact, uh, okay, I guess we can, I guess we can, we can, we can give the proof here. Yeah, I was planning to do it later, but I think it fits very nicely. What was that? So, in fact, what, what do we see? We see that new is P star P. And then, well, P composed with T equals P. So P star, T star, P is also the same. So this is since P composed with T equals P. And then here yeah, there is a little exercise to do to say that since P is G equivariant, this is the same as mu star P star P. So this requires writing down the definition of, yeah, what is this map T star and what is the action on, on the space of, uh, what is the action of the group on the space of sequences? And then from there, of course, that's, that's by just by definition, that was obvious. Okay. So yeah, the only the only non-trivial part is this one in the middle that I invite you to try to do it yourself because it's good to unravel the definition. Okay. Are there more questions? Okay, so now we are finally ready, actually, for the definition of Boston boundary. So definition. So again, if we if we start with a measure group, then. Yeah, so basically a mu boundary then yeah. Then a mu boundary. So we start with a mu boundary. B mu is the Poisson boundary or Poisson first number boundary. So I will write first number now and then since it's too long I will not mention it again, but If indeed the Poisson transform which is phi from our infinity of B nu into H infinity of G mu is an isomorphism, is bijective. Is bijective. And in fact, this becomes an isometric isomorphism between the, uh, these two, yeah, these two Banach algebras. If you if you have the appropriate norms, so on 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 either side. So that the quest is to choose to find some B new that that works. Also, we have to figure out whether this is unique. So in fact, in a, it's unique, but it's a unique in a, in a somewhat weak sense. So we say that person boundary is unique, well, as a measurable G space. 
So basically, it means that two such two such spaces where they must have a measurable function between them that carries the measure from one to the other, and also that it's equivariant with respect to the G action. So this is, uh, you know, it's 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 a, it's unique in this category, but in, in the sense of geometry, sometimes it's slightly confusing because it could be, for instance, that we take a you take a space that is a Poisson boundary, and it will remove, say, a set of measure zero, and that it's it's okay. So that's the this we cannot tell. So for instance, if B new is the Poisson boundary and let's see B zero in B is G invariant and of measure zero, then P zero and with, with with the restriction of new is also but for instance it's very clear that the fact that the boundary is trivial on the other hand is is a is a definitely strong invariant. It's so the boundary is trivial. We say that the boundary is trivial. If if it's isomorphic to just a to just a point, so if B equals a point with just the delta mass of that point satisfies the definition. So if the measure has only one atom, okay, the, this even in the category of measurable spaces, this is uh, invariant. This is a, a strong thing to check. Definition. And obviously by, by the definition, equivalently, if the only bounded harmonic functions on G, Are the constants. So of course this is the same as uh, famous results for for classical harmonic functions. So we call it the Liouville theorem. So this is sometimes called the Liouville property. That. Yeah, if there, there is no non-trivial bounded harmonic functions, then we say that this, this group with a measure has a new property. And then for certain groups, the new property is true for all measures, for instance, for abelian groups. But uh, yeah, otherwise uh, there are more, more complicated things because this also depends on the measurement. Okay, are there any more questions? Okay, so now we can we can somehow get a little closer to the actual construction of this space because it's very uh, abstract at this point. We we don't even know that it exists, and I mean, in fact, the construction itself is also unfortunately somewhat non-constructive. So. So that's one of the reasons why it's indeed very nice whenever we can have a geometric construction of the Poisson boundary, like for instance, it's the Gromov boundary or visual boundary or these kind of things. 
because the abstract measure theoretic definition that we're going to see is still somewhat indirect. Okay, so, so the construction has something to do with, uh, uh, yeah, it is somewhat delicate in, in, in measure theory. So it has to do with the theory of measurable partitions. And so, so we look at the following. So, so again, so we look at a measured group. You know, and then again, T from omega to omega is the shift. For sample paths, and now we want to give a first identification. So the Russell boundary is defined as a quotient. So the first thing you want to say is we say the two paths. Omega, omega prime in omega are equivalent if at some point after some number of shifts they coincide. So if there exists M and N such that T N of omega equals T M of omega prime. Okay, and so we denote this equivalence relation as equivalence relation with this T. So you see, this is the, the first thing that would make sense to think about is because you see, you want to say what is the boundary behavior of the walk, and so Okay, suppose you, you, you have two paths, like a blue path and a pink path. And suppose that at some point, the two paths coincide. And they start, well, they coincide at some time and then they start coinciding forever. Well, then obviously, whatever the boundary behavior is, it makes sense to say that the boundary behavior of both paths is the same. Well, that's an in natural equivalence relation. However, it's really tricky because if we just take the quotient of omega by this equivalence relation as a set, then we get a space which has really bad properties from the point of view of measure theory. And so that, that's why, in fact, it's a, quite tricky to to give the, the precise definition. So, so the issue is that, yeah, if you look at omega and a quotient by T as a set, has bad measure theoretic properties. And so in order to get rid of that, we have to, yeah, we, we have to talk about uh, um, our components and we have to talk about uh, standard measure spaces. So, okay, so, so we have to introduce standard measure spaces. Okay, so first of all, when, when our two measure space is the same, well, that's not surprising. Whenever there's a 
you know, there is a uh, measurable isomorphism between them, meaning that two measurable bijective functions. So a map F from a space X with the sigma algebra A to another space Y with the sigma algebra B is a Borel isomorphism if, well, if it is bijective, measurable, meaning that the pre-image of elements in B are elements in A, and the inverse is also measurable. Okay. And the best spaces that we care about are so-called standard spaces. So a space, a measure, measurable space, a real space, in the space of the sigma algebra is standard if it is isomorphic to, for instance, the standard, the unit interval with the Borel sets. So this is our favorite sigma algebra. However, it, it turns out that the fact that we pick zero or one, of course, is somewhat arbitrary. So in fact, you can remark that you could pick any other Polish space. So you can take every, any complete separable matrix space. with the Borel sigma algebra, it's Borel sigma algebra, so the sigma algebra generated by the open sets is standard. So for historical reasons, we, we like to start with zero one, but okay, we could we could start with any complete separable metric space. What is important is that there are these countable sets, for instance, intervals with rational endpoints that somehow filtered the whole space in the, in the following way. Well, okay. okay. So, and also what is nice about the standard spaces is that you can take subsets and products. So, so if, M is standard and A in M is measurable. Then A is also standard. So we start with a complete metric space, but then we can take any measurable subsets of it. So the original metric is no longer complete, but it doesn't matter. Is still a homomorphic, yeah, it's still isomorphic as a measure of space to, to another complete measure of space. So, yeah, this 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 uh, equivalence relation is, is pretty weak, but still we need to say something. Okay. And moreover, the product of two standard spaces. Standard, I think, even the countable product, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, and then we want to put a measure on it. So, so far we have all the sigma algebra, and we say that a measure space, a measure space, not, not just a Borel space, so x a with a measure mu is standard. Well, if x a is standard, uh, 
So you take a so now this measure could be atomic, could have an atomic part. However, yeah, sometimes we, we, we don't want that. So we could say that a little bit, yeah, the standard measure space. It's called the back space. If the measure of the whole space is one, so for me to measure. So basically always in our course. And it's smooth. Smooth the back space if it has no atom. Okay, well, this is just a, a lot of definitions. But yeah, these definitions are somehow important because this is the category of spaces in which we, we want to work. Okay, and then we have to take a quotient and we take quotient by partition. So a partition. of a Borel space, XA is the family sign of spaces of C where, yeah, of this joint, Measurable sets such that the union of all of them is the space example. So that's nothing strange, just a usual partition. And of course, whenever you have a partition, given a partition, we have. We have a projection map. Pi from X to the to X mod sorry as a set. And then one can define what our structure so on the quotient. By by lifting by yeah, by sort of pushing pushing down the the one on 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 X in the following way by saying by declaring as you as you as you would imagine like a set set B which is a subset of X psi is measurable. If the pre image pi inverse of the x is measured. So, again, nothing too strange. This is just a whole bunch of definitions. And so, the issue, however, is that whenever we yeah, and also, yeah, also given a probability, if if P is a probability on X, we can set, you know, you can pi star of P on X mod psi is also probability. However, the, the big issue here, the big warning here, is that taking this quotient, K 
can make us exit the category of manager space of a standard manager space. So even so if X A mu is standard, it is not necessarily the case. that the quotient is also standard. But X mod psi with this, with this, so let's say pi star of A, and pi star of U. And, and that's the annoying thing, basically. Are there any questions? I'll, I'll, I'll show you an example. Okay, so and and, and that's the issue. And, and in fact, this for, for for this for this reason, we we have to use what are called measurable partitions. as defined by Rothman. So again, the measure for a partition is not, as the name suggests, just a partition in measurable sets. <laughs> it, it, it's more, and that's the, that's the annoying part. So, okay, maybe maybe I can give you one more definition and then we can, we can take a break and then we'll see an example. The definition is that a family of Borel sets separate point separates points if for any X and Y in your space with X different from Y, there is a set from B in the family such that X belongs to B, but Y does not belong to B. So the easiest example here would be if we if we stay if our space is the interval in an interval then maybe we can we can pick C to be the set of intervals A B such that A and B are rationals. So clearly, whenever you have two points, two real numbers, you can find an interval with rational endpoints such that one number is contained in it and the other is not. Okay, so maybe it's time for a break unless there's any questions. Yeah, so then we can, uh, yeah, we can resume at 11.10. Hello again. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. good. Okay, so we can, we can um, keep, keep going. So, yeah, so finally we, we have all the, um, all the definitions on this, on this uh, measurable partitions. And we well, again, we would like to take this quotient, but we have to be careful. 
And an example indeed is, is the following, which is given by irrational rotations on the torus. So first of all, so we said that family of rel set separates points, if for every two points in your space, there is a rel set in this family that can such that you know one point is contained there and the other one is not. The canonical example is intervals in the in, in the unit interval with rational endpoints. And yes, the last definition in this context would be to say that a Borel space is countably separated, a Borel space. A is countably separated if there exists a countable family of parallel sets. That separates points. Okay. So again, an example is the above one of the unit circle of the yeah, interval in unique circles, so for example. is indeed this one, that's why we call it our standard example. But then what is more interesting is counterexample, non-example. And the counterexample is like, is like this. So we take X to be S1, which is arm of Z, and we take C of X to be X plus alpha mod one, where alpha is irrational. Okay. And then we take the orbit. So we take, we take X to Y if, See again, there exists M and N in Z, in fact, such that T and X equals T and Y. And then if you take X mod, this relation is not countably separated. And, and why is that? Well, suppose that there is so set. So suppose there is a family B N countable family. That separates. So now for each n, consider the partition Pn, which is the you know refi common refinement of the partition Bi and Bi complement. So basically, for each n, I can tell whether a point is in Vn or not. And so for if I do this for the first n of them, I have two to the n sets, right? So which consists of 
Two to the eleventh cent. Now the irrational rotation on the circle is ergodic. So and and all these are unions of orbits. So since Uh, yes, it's all PIs are union of orbits. So the T invariant, T invariant. And then, moreover, the system is ergodic. is ergodic with respect to the Lebesgue measure. There exists always, you see, there I either, each, each element of PN either has measure zero or one. Each PN has either measure zero or one. But of course, the total mass is one. So, so there has to be for each n one sequence that has measure one. So, for each n, there exists exactly one. Yes, one element. And what is, yeah, what element of Pn of measure one? So, yeah, so. It, it, in fact, so it's, it's equivalent to say, so setting, we can also do it, say it another way, setting, uh, you know, bi plus equals bi, and bi minus equals the complement, bi complement, <laughs> there is a sequence Epsilon one, epsilon n in plus or minus one, such that precisely the the measure of you know b i epsilon b one epsilon one intersect b two epsilon two intersect b n epsilon n. So there is precisely one, and that. Each n, of course, these sets are, are nested because the partition gets far, farther and finer since Pn plus one is refinement of Pn, means these are nested. So you can pick and you can find an infinite that exists. An infinite sequence epsilon n such as indeed u of b1 epsilon 1 intersect b2 epsilon 2 b n epsilon n equals 1 for every n. And so if you take the intersection, so mu of you know. You take the intersection of B i epsilon i. This is a sequence of nested sets, intersection of nested sets of measure one, so it has to be measure one. Right? But on the other hand, yeah, this cannot be just one orbit. 
since let's see the measure of every orbit is zero because you see the Lamech measure is non-atomic and every orbit for the ship for, for the for this rotation for this irrational rotation every orbit is measure zero so you see it cannot be that this intersection is not a single orbit It has to be, in fact, uncountably many orbits, and so so this so V N does not separate points, right? Because if it separated points, if you take two elements in this intersection, then there would be some index for which X is in V. And but not that y is not in the same VN. However, the way we constructed this this intersection means that every element there either you know for every element there either it belongs to be or either all of them belong to be one or all of them don't belong to be one and so forth. So the trick again here, of course, this can be generalized every time. Of course, remark. Of course, this applies every time to any dynamical system. Which is ergodic. And whose measure is non atomic. Right? This is the same thing. Each orbit has measure zero. And so it's not enough to have countably many elements that separate points. Because by ergodicity, all the sets are indistinguishable from each other. Are there any questions? And so for this reason, we define what is called the space of ergodic components. Again, if if x a u is a bag measure space and t from x to x Measurable map Yes, then yeah, then we can we have to define the, the space of regarding components, which then we yeah, we, we have to enlarge the the equivalence classes. We cannot just take uh, take the orbits as equivalence classes. Otherwise, the the, uh, the quotient is is too too bad. Okay, so yeah, actually, maybe let me first first say another thing. Sorry about that. Okay, 
So we call it, okay, so a partition sign of X is called measurable. Again, this is the theory of measurable partitions of Euclid. If, this, if the quotient X mod psi is countably separated. And in fact, the theorem that, that Roth includes is that this is enough. So if x a mu is a back space, x i is a measurable partition. Then the quotient, indeed, x mod psi, mod psi, l plus star mu is a lot blank space. So whenever we have a major rotation, we, we can indeed do the quotient, and it's not a problem. And so this leads to the definition of measurable envelope. So we start with the partition. Then the partition psi hat is the measurable envelope. of Xi, if Xi hat is the finest, the, measurable partition, that is refined by Xi. Right, so what is the idea? The idea is that one needs to enlarge equivalence classes in order to make the quotient the bank. Okay, and and in fact that the even somewhat hard theorem of Rothman is the existence of such a thing. So if if X is a partition of all about space. Then it exists measurable envelope. Of X of Psi. So in fact, the example, going back to the example of the irrational rotation, you get the following that if X 
if x is S1 and t is an irrational rotation, as we said before, then, yeah, so basically the only way to, to make this measurable is to take a trivial partition. The measurable envelope of Xi, which is the partition into orbits, is the trivial partition. That it's a bit disappointed, maybe, but uh, that's uh, that that's what it is. So, in order to, yeah, you have to take some union of orbits, and since the final, the see, yeah, since the actual map is ergodic, then the only way to do it is to put all the orbits in the same class. So clearly then the quotient is just an X mod psi hat is, is just a point. So yeah, so that, that that's the only thing that can happen. And in fact, uh, this in dynamics goes gives rise to what's called the uh, space of ergodic components. So again, if you start with the Lebesgue space, T amount from X to X, then the quotient of X by, not by the, the partition, but by the measurable envelope of this equivalence relation given by orbits is called the space of ergodic components. And denoted by X with a double bar. So in fact, this point, this is a point if and only if the map is ergodic. Okay, so in fact, there is a universal property
which is the following. So if Yeah, if f from x to some space y is a t invariant measurable functions, t invariant means f composite t is f, then F factors uniquely through through X multi. So right, so basically the, the, the diagram is like that. This X, there is X or T, there is F, so this is the projection, this is Y, and then you have unique G like that. And so in general, we have by definition, by this universal property that L infinity of X A mu, if we take the T invariant, so the T invariant functions on X, this are canonically identified with L infinity of the quotient of X or T with, yeah, with the appropriate uh, sigma algebra A or T and pi star. So you see, this is by yeah, it's all it's all somewhat by construction. We it's a bit it's it's quite indirect, but it somehow works precisely because we define it so that it has this universal problem. So this is in general for a dynamical system, but the Poisson boundary is a special case of this. So we can define it or construct it like this. So given again, a measure group. G mu. Let omega P be the space of infinite space sample paths. and T, the shift. And then the Poisson boundary of G mu is indeed B Poisson you know, Poisson would be the quotient of omega P by this relation, where the quotient is in this sense by looking at this measurable envelope. So again, this is not really explicit in, in any way, fortunately. That's just how it is. But it it you know it shows that there is a connection between between this uh, harmonic functions and this theory of uh, partitions and measurable partitions and this uh, universal quotient that was introduced by Rocklin. 
And so basically, again, what we do is we take all infinite sample paths and we want to identify them if two of them after a time shift coincide. But this quotient would, would be not a Lebesgue space. And so we have to pick the finest partition, which is still much coarser than, than, than this one, that guarantees that this quotient indeed is Lebesgue space. And again, this exists, this construction exists in other parts of dynamics, and this is called the theory of uh, space of a Gaudi components. Okay. Uh, I don't see the screen anymore. Okay, now we see the screen anymore. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, perfect. Yeah, sorry, that was, uh, that was a short break. <laughs> okay, very good. So um, are there any questions so far? I, yeah, this is a, a lot of math and a slight, slightly, slightly disappointing in a way that the point is indeed, this is not very, Explicit, that's, that's the issue. Okay, so indeed that, that's why the, the big question that we really want to answer is given a space, given again G, acting on some space and you know x in the boundary of x modification and then mu probability and g yes there are two steps there are two steps to identify the Poisson boundary. The first one is to show that almost every sample path converges to the boundary. And the second is to show, so the first step will tell us I read something quite non trivial. This will tell us the boundary of X with new is a new boundary. But then we have to make sure that this is not just a new boundary, but it is a Poisson boundary. So show that boundary of X new is maximum. In fact, I would remark that there is a very precise sense in which the Poisson boundary is the largest of those uh, new boundaries. And as Vivian was commenting, we can always compactify with a point and that would always be a new boundary. But if there are more harmonic functions, this is not good compactification. So it, it's, so, it's similar to this theory of uh, quotients. We cannot quotient everything to a point. I mean, we, we could, we can do that, but this this would be the space of Agadi components only if the actual dynamics we start from is honestly um, ergodic. Otherwise, this would not work. Okay. And so, And so the, hence, from there, yeah, hence this would be the Poisson boundary. In fact, 
Uh, right. So in fact, let's let's recall the universal property. So much like we, we had before, we have a universal property. Of the Poisson model, right? And the universal property is the following. It's, it's, we have a diagram like that. We have omega, which projects to the Poisson boundaries. So we have this projection. So this is omega p. Dp near p. And then suppose we have a t equivariant, t invariant map to another space um, lambda. Suppose there is a map like that. For any t invariant and g equivariant. map F out of the space of infinite paths into mu lambda into a mu boundary. There exists a map which goes out of it. G such that you know F is G composable. So any map out of the space of infinite paths that goes into a G uh, into mu boundary at this T invariant factors through the Poisson. So this is this is why we say that the upshot is so yeah. <laughs> the Poisson boundary is the maximum of Poisson. The sense that you do the quotient by you know the finest equivalence relation, so it has the most most points, but still, yeah, of all the possible such such quotients that respect all of the structure. And again, so so here is is the usual usual step. So, so whenever you're in a geometric situation, the goal is to show the both things. So we have to show that first of all that the boundary that the random walk does converge to the boundary, and that gives us a new boundary. And then we want to show that this boundary that we we are given is indeed the maximal one. So we cannot further split apart these points in the bound. And of course, to make this, uh, to get a handle of it, we, we have to use some, some other tool. And in fact, this will be the entropy theory that we we're gonna talk about next time. So let me just finish by stating the main theorem of first number. So you see, we have the inverse. Poisson transform. So the we have a Poisson transform in one direction, and then we have the inverse Poisson transform. Is the following is a map from now from H infinity G mu to an infinity of 
Vp nu p. But we know by definition that the space of rounded functions on a Poisson boundary is the same as the space of functions on this path space that is T invariant. This is by definition. And so we define the map like this. So given H, which is a harmonic function, you consider again Xn, which is H on the random walk. And first of all, we have to prove that this is a martingale. And so by the martingale convergence theorem, we can define lambda h on this sample path as the limit of this martingale, like we did before in similar situations. And so if the limit exists, it is shift invariant because again, it's a time limit. And so, so lambda of H is a function in on the path space, which is T invariant which by the universal property is also a bounded function on the Poisson boundary. And so now the, the theorem, and we still have to prove to make sure that everything works out nicely, is that again, for any measure group, And let you see that phi be the Poisson transform from L infinity to the Poisson boundary to H infinity of G mu. And lambda is the inverse transform. Then clearly phi composed with lambda should be the identity and, and the same should be true for the other one. And lambda composed with phi. Sorry, everyone. I, I think, I, think I, I, I ran out of button. <laughs> So yeah, so we'll, we'll, we'll yeah we'll we'll stop here for today. So I uh, will I will uh, yeah I will present this last last theorem next time. It's it's okay. Yeah. Okay, good. Anyways, so the next next class will be in, in person. Anyways, so well for the people who are in Toronto, otherwise as also as usual in. Uh, online. Are there any questions? Okay, good. So I'll see you guys next time. Yeah, sorry. Thank you. Last, last <laughs> issue.